Is your favorite store now accepting Bitcoin? Cryptocurrencies got a huge boost in price and an adoption recently. What's in the news with stories on a hero's update, hide your kids, rules for rulers, Tulsi Gabbard again, buy an economics book, and bad boys. And an ask me anything with a huge question on the fair tax and movie swaps. This episode is brought to you by Health Excellence Plus, a health share that has saved my family thousands of dollars and can save you money too. Also brought to you by ForkFest, the third annual decentralized libertarian camping event that happens right before ForkFest, with no tickets and no one in charge. Welcome to The Lava Flow, channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week. From the state that is number one in the country for opportunity, according to U.S. News and World Report, this is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Rebellion needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 132, The Rise of Bitcoin. When there have already been more than 342 people killed by police this year, and the United States debt clock shows us at more than $22 trillion, $310 billion, $200 million in debt. What's wrestling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. Cryptocurrencies got a huge boost in usability recently, and it is a game changer for sure. And with prices rising significantly the past few weeks, it is clear that things are back on the rise for crypto. Now, I've seen a personal increase of nearly 50% in my crypto holdings in the last 30 days, and I couldn't be happier about that, especially after the last year and a half of stagnation. I am certainly glad that I kept buying during that time. I hope you guys took my advice and bought as well. Now, like I've said several times, the best time to buy crypto was in 2009. The second best time is right now. The big news recently is that, for the first time since the inception of Bitcoin, several major big-box retailers will begin accepting it as a payment option. The retail initiative comes via a partnership between Flexa, a payment startup, and Gemini, the Winklevoss-owned digital currency company. It works by piggybacking on the digital scanners that many big-box retailers use to accept phone-based payments from their apps and from digital wallets like Apple Pay. What Flexa has done is to persuade the retailers to configure their scanners to recognize payments from their cryptocurrency app, which is called Spedden. The customer simply holds up their app to pay. The store cashier will typically be unaware the customer is paying with crypto, while the merchant receives a real-time payment in the form of currency of their choosing, crypto or dollars. As one of the very first widespread, low-friction opportunities for consumers to shop with cryptocurrencies, This is potentially a huge deal. The Spedden app lets users spend four types of crypto currently, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, and a so-called stable coin called a Gemini dollar, which is pegged to the value of one U.S. dollar and backed by banking giant State Street. Over the years, some merchants have tried accepting Bitcoin, but many eventually abandoned it, in part because of slow processing times on cryptocurrency networks. Meanwhile, for consumers, using cryptocurrency as an everyday payment mechanism has proved impractical because of crypto's volatility. A wallet with $100 worth of Bitcoin at the start of the week may only be worth $80 by week's end, or it could be worth $120. But this time around, merchants may be more comfortable offering crypto payments because the scanner system provides an easy way to accept them, and because Flexa offers a real-time network to clear the transactions. Gemini takes care of the back-end operations, and the merchant typically receives the cash equivalent of whatever crypto amount the consumer paid. According to Flexa CEO Tyler Spaulding, the appeal for merchants is a chance to lower the commission fees that they pay to existing payment networks. Spaulding, who is a veteran of the gift card exchange service Raise, added that crypto payments also offer stores a way to experiment with new types of blockchain-based customer rewards. According to the Winklevoss twins, the volatility problem can be mitigated by using the Gemini dollar, which is pegged to keep its value very close to $1 U.S. 
In an interview with Fortune, they predicted Flex's ease of use, combined with the stability of the Gemini dollar, will lead to more widespread use, especially among the growing number of people who appreciate the technology behind cryptocurrency. Tyler Winklevoss said, The idea of living on crypto can now be a reality. You can now do it. For the consumer, it amounts to being crypto-conscious. It's like being green. Meanwhile, Flex's Spalding told Fortune magazine that the company will provide developer kits to other companies that want to incorporate the scanner payment technology into their own apps. Guys, this is another fucking huge win for cryptocurrencies, hands down. The Flexa website says right now that there are 30,475 retail stores in their network that accept these cryptocurrencies. That is fucking huge, guys. Now, I could not find an all-encompassing list of retailers that accept these payments yet, but here's a partial list of the huge brand-name stores that you can walk into and use the Flexa app to pay with cryptocurrencies. Amazon-owned Whole Foods stores, Crate & Barrel, Nordstrom, Regal Cinemas, GameStop, Baskin Robbins, Starbucks, Petco, Lowe's, Office Depot, and many more. So guys, go buy some cryptocurrencies. Download the Spedden app and go buy some stuff with it. I know I plan to for sure. And while you're at it, make sure to use some of your crypto to support this show at thelavaflow.com slash support. Thanks so much. Have you subscribed to The Lava Flow on iTunes or any mobile device yet? Then what's wrong with you? Go to thelavaflow.com slash subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the show. And while you're subscribing, make sure to leave me a five-star rating and review the show to help others find our podcast. Thelavaflow.com slash subscribe. What's in the news? you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In a Heroes Update news, Chelsea Manning was once again found in contempt by a federal judge for refusing to testify before a grand jury, and she will return to jail just seven days after being released from the exact same jail. The judge also ruled that she will be fined $500 per day after 30 days and $1,000 per day after 60 days. Now they want to bankrupt her along with taking away her freedom. Fuck this judge in the net for $1,000 a day. Manning, a former Army intelligence analyst, was released from federal custody last week after spending 62 days in jail for refusing to testify before another grand jury in March about her disclosure of military and diplomatic secrets to WikiLeaks in 2010. The questioning was apparently part of a continued effort by federal prosecutors investigating WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and Manning was subsequently held in contempt. Manning was slapped with a second subpoena while in jail to appear before the grand jury Thursday, but for the same questions, according to a tweet posted on Manning's Twitter account last week. Assistant U.S. Attorney Thomas Traxler argued Thursday that Manning holds the keys to the jailhouse door, while Manning told Judge Anthony Tringa that she would rather starve to death than testify. Man, the balls on this woman. Tringa replied, There's nothing dishonorable in fulfilling your obligation as a United States citizen. What the actual fuck? I don't recall any statement or oath that I or Chelsea or anyone else took saying that we had to talk before a grand jury or incriminate ourselves to others. As a matter of fact, the Constitution says the exact opposite of that. Manning had formally asked the court to release her earlier this month, saying nothing will convince me to testify, according to the documents filed in the Eastern District of Virginia Court. A federal appeals court rejected her argument for release, that her rights were violated by the subpoena proceedings, and the federal prosecutors purportedly seek to entrap her back in April. Representatives for Manning had previously said that she was kept in her cell for 22 hours a day arguing that such solitary confinement threatened her health and and amounted to torture. I mean, look, talk about authoritarianism. And so much for the right to not self-incriminate yourself, supposedly enshrined in the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Unfit to fucking exist. In Hide Your Kids news, a Guatemalan mother lost her effort to get back her five-year-old son, who was taken away from her after her arrest on immigration charges, and put up for adoption in Missouri despite her objections. 
A Missouri judge ruled the boys should stay with the Missouri couple, Melinda and Seth Moser, who took him into their home five years ago while his mother was in federal custody, where she attempted in vain to oppose the adoption proceedings. Encarnacion Bale Romero said, Nobody could help me because I don't speak English. The child, born as Carlos but renamed Jameson by the Mosers, has been with his adoptive parents in Carthage, Missouri since the age of 11 months. The judge said the biological mother had no rights to even see her child, according to the mother's lawyer. Her lawyer, Curtis Woods, said that he would appeal the decision of the judge, who he said ruled Romero's parent parental rights had been terminated because she had abandoned him while she was incarcerated. Wait, what? The government made up a stupid rule about an imaginary line that they protect due to having a monopoly on violence. Then they kidnap this woman for crossing that imaginary line. They lock her in a cage for years and then say she abandoned her child? Bullshit. The government kidnapped her fucking child. The judge handed down the decision in a courtroom closed to all but the parties involved and their lawyers. There was no translator provided by the court for the Guatemalan woman, who speaks only a tiny bit of English. The ruling allows the formal adoption proceedings by the Mosiers to proceed. So much for justice in the U.S. justice system. As most of you know, I was laid off from my 9-to-5 director of IT job last summer. Among the many terrifying things about losing your job is losing your health benefits. Our family went about six months without any kind of health insurance, and the anxiety and worry that came along with that was not insignificant. But after spending dozens of hours researching our options and quickly rejecting the $2,000 a month price tag that came with the options available with traditional insurance, we found Health Excellence Plus, a health share that was a fraction of the cost, and we're glad we did. Only a few weeks after joining as members of this health share program, my wife was diagnosed with a common skin cancer that requires an expensive procedure to remove the cancer and another surgery to repair the damage done from the cancer removal. When this is all said and done, Health Excellence Plus will have saved our family thousands of dollars. And I'll bet they can save you money too. Health Excellence Plus is a health share that meets the requirements of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. A health share is a community of like-minded, health-focused members who have joined together to share each other's medical costs above an amount they can comfortably afford. A health share is not traditional health insurance. It is designed to be a catastrophic coverage for major items, like my wife's surgery. The cost of an average family insurance policy for a primary 45 years old with a $5,000 deductible is $1,450 per month. A Health Excellence Plus $500 initial and shareable amount with a health care strategy is only $783. Get started saving money today at thelavaflow.com slash health. That's thelavaflow.com slash health. In Rules for Rulers news, President Trump has indicated that he is considering pardons for several American military members accused or convicted of war crimes including high-profile cases of murder, attempted murder, and desecration of a corpse, according to two U.S. officials. And, of course he will. A ruler has to protect those who do his bidding and secure his rule, after all. The officials said that the Trump administration had made expedited requests this week for paperwork needed to pardon the troops on or around Memorial Day. One request is for Special Operations Chief Edward Gallagher of the Navy SEALs, who is scheduled to stand trial in the coming weeks on charges of shooting unarmed civilians and killing an enemy captive with a knife while deployed in Iraq. The others are believed to include the case of a former Blackwater security contractor recently found guilty in the deadly 2007 shooting of dozens of unarmed Iraqis. The case of Major Matthew L. Goldstein, the Army Green Beret accused of killing an unarmed Afghan in 2010, and the case of a group of Marine Corps snipers charged with urinating on the corpses of dead Taliban fighters. Navy SEALs who served with Chief Gallagher told authorities that he indiscriminately shot at civilians, gunning down a young woman in a flowered hijab and an unarmed old man. They also said he stabbed a teenage captive, then bragged about it in text messages. His trial is set to start at the end of this month, 
If convicted, he faces life in prison. He has pleaded not guilty and denies all the charges. Major Goldstein is charged with killing an Afghan man that he and other soldiers said had bomb-making materials. After an interrogation, the soldiers let the man go. Fearing that the man would have returned to making improvised explosives, which had already killed two Marines in the area, Major Goldstein later said that he killed the man. Mr. Trump has singled out both men on Twitter, calling Major Goldstein a U.S. military hero and praising Chief Gallagher for his service to the country. The Blackwater contractor, Nicholas A. Slatton, is one of several Blackwater contractors charged in the killing of 17 Iraqis and the wounding of 20 more on a Baghdad street. After a number of mistrials and other delays, he is the only one who has been convicted. The Marines charged in urinating on the corpse of a Taliban fighter were caught after a video of the act was found. Now look, these men are all, unequivocally, monsters. Yet, monsters paid for by your stolen tax money and wearing the uniform and flag of your rulers and let loose to just create mayhem. Should we be surprised when our rulers protect such men? Of course not. Birds of a feather flock together. In Tulsi Gabbard news, I am shocked. I say shocked at how much controversy I received over my last episode calling Tulsi Gabbard a socialist. I mean, I knew the Ron Paul worship was bad, but God damn, I had no idea how bad. I mean, look, I like a lot of things about Ron Paul too, but these people literally worship the man. I had less controversy over my episode on vaccinations, for crying out loud. Who would have thought that calling out a politician who wants universal health care would be so controversial among people calling themselves libertarians? No wonder I rarely use the word libertarian to identify myself anymore. These days, I much prefer voluntarist. I cannot tell you how many times I was told, so what if she wants universal health care? She's anti-war. But is she really? No, of course she's not. She's only anti-Republican war. Just like every other politician, she's fine with war as long as someone from her party or her tribe is the one running the war. It sounds a lot like Ron Paul bots who jump on every word that comes out of his mouth as if it were gospel. For some reason, like I mentioned last week, she still has her congressional campaign website up from her last race when Obama was president. Here's what she had to say about the war on terror, for example. By working with local partners on the ground, providing advice and air support, along with special forces teams who can launch quick strikes missions, we can overwhelm ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and other terrorist organizations and have in place local elements securing and governing the territory retaken. It is encouraging that President Obama has recently begun exploring ways for the U.S. and Russia to work together to defeat ISIS. It is critical that we remain willing to ally with Russia, Syrian forces, the Kurdish Peshmerga, and any other forces that are willing to fight against our common enemy. She is not anti-war. Stop supporting Tulsi Gabbard. And if you're not going to stop supporting her, stop calling yourself a libertarian while you do it. Hell, stop supporting politicians, period. Stop supporting politics. Stop supporting putting your man as a ruler over me, no matter who that man may be. Join the liberty-minded voluntarists, anarchists, and libertarians this summer from June 13th through June 18th for ForkFest 2019 at Rogers Campground in the beautiful White Mountains of New Hampshire. ForkFest happens right before the Porcupine Freedom Festival, and ForkFest is decentralized, which means that no one is in charge. This also means that there's no ticket cost. Just reserve your camping or RV site or motel room with Rogers Campground for June 13th through the 18th. You can simply relax and go camping with other Liberty lovers, or you can create whatever experience or event you'd like others to have. If you're planning an event for ForkFest, be sure to let others know in advance. You can connect with other ForkFesters via the unofficial Telegram chat or the ForkFest forum. Links to both of those are on the unofficial website, forkfest.party. That's forkfest.party. This is the third year of this event, and I have attended all of them so far, so I hope to see you there this year. Get all of the information at ForkFest.Party. In Buy an Economics book news, the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO, has taken a radical turn in a few of its recent social media postings, 
winking at the idea of airline workers executing their bosses and encouraging the proletariat to literally seize the means of production. The AFL-CIO tweeted out an explainer video from self-described anti-capitalist worker-owned streaming platform Means TV, featuring Dan Whalen, identified as a Marxist roofer, explaining that the middle class is actually an illusion spread by the owners of society to divide the working class. Whalen said in the video, All workers under capitalism are subject to the same conditions of constantly producing more for as little wage compensation as possible. Now, differences in income, type of work, or lifestyle that we used to draw distinctions between working and middle-class wage earners are all a fiction, he goes on to say, created by the rich and the media to divide and distract workers from the inherent class conflicts in our society. The country's largest labor organization apparently found these textbook Marxist talking points convincing enough to tweet out the video, along with a caption, We all need to seize the means of production. Now, this is not the first time the AFL-CIO has courted controversy in the past few weeks with some of its social media content. Last week, in response to a widely circulated picture of a Delta Airlines poster suggesting that its workers would have more money for video game consoles if they didn't pay union dues, the AFL-CIO tweeted out a meme suggesting that, deprived of a union, workers would be spending that money on a guillotine instead. Now look, I'd love to see a bunch of commies start trying to seize the means of production in a country with a level of gun ownership that we have in the U.S., especially here in New Hampshire. A guillotine would not be expedient enough for them because they would have all died from lead poisoning. They can get away with this shit in oppressive countries where no one is armed. They wouldn't be able to get away with it here. In Bad Boys News, jail guards in Jackson County, Missouri, joked that a prisoner had jail-itis and threatened her as she died in custody. The family of Regina Thurman is suing her jailers and nurses following Thurman's preventable death behind bars in Jackson County, Missouri. According to the lawsuit, Thurman passed away on January 20, 2017, while being admitted to the Jackson County Department of Corrections. Thurman told authorities that she had chest pain and that one of her legs was numb. Unbeknownst to Thurman, her aorta was tearing. According to the suit, her jailers should have recognized her symptoms as signs of either a tear, specifically, or some kind of heart attack. Yet, neither the prison guards nor jail medical staff took Thurman's complaints seriously. Rather than contacting emergency services, a guard had Thurman wheeled into a dressing room so she could change into her jail clothes. When Thurman ended up on the floor, another guard assumed that she was intentionally holding her breath. That guard told her to breathe, relax, and put your clothes on. A third joke that Thurman was suffering from jailitis during the intake process. Thurman was then screened by a nurse named Jennifer Grimshaw, who checked her vital signs. This was the only medical care she received before she died. A fucking vital sign check. A second nurse by the name of Miranda Van Stratton documented that she had checked Thurman's vital signs multiple times through the evening. She said that they appeared to be normal and offered Thurman Tums tablets as she believed Thurman had heartburn. But, of course, video from the jail revealed that Van Stratton had not actually taken the vital signs as she said, not a single time. Videos also revealed that Thurman was left alone without attention from a guard or nurse for 18 minutes at one point. Thurman was threatened by a nurse when she was commanded to stand, despite her crying on the floor that she was in pain and unable to move. The nurse said that if she did not stand, she would be sent to the medical housing where she would be unable to make calls to her family. A fellow inmate had already called Thurman's daughter while the incident unfolded. The inmate told Thurman's daughter that Thurman was experiencing chest pains and was being ignored. The inmate later said that she believed Thurman would get care if her daughter called the facility. Other inmates helped Thurman by alerting the guards or assisting her in standing. When potential criminals care more about human life than the police who say that they're trying to protect you, then you know you've got a police state. Emergency paramedics were not called until after Thurman went completely pulseless. Yes, folks, this stuff is happening in prisons in this country. This is not North Korea or some other bass backwards third-world shithole. It doesn't have to be. What it is, though, is a nation under rule by a police state, just like North Korea. Thank <laughs> you.
Exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per episode donation of as little as a buck an episode. Or use Bitcoin. Get exclusive content, rewards, and help the lava flow become fiscally neutral while providing you more content. Thelavaflow.com slash support. Ask me anything. Roger will answer your questions about, well, anything. Do you have a question for Roger? Email AMA at thelavaflow.com or add your question to the latest AMA thread in the Pax Libertas Productions Facebook group. It's that time again. I'm going to answer your burning questions. Remember, you can ask me your questions by adding it to the thread that I post in the Pax Libertas Productions Podcast Fans Facebook group or by emailing me at AMA at thelavaflow.com. Or if you're awesome as fuck and you support the show, you can ask me your question in the Lava Flow Super Supporters Facebook group or in Patreon. So let's jump into the questions this week. I have a question from a supporter who is asked to remain nameless. He was so upset that I didn't get to his question last week that he emailed me afterwards telling me he was disappointed that I ignored his question. Of course, I didn't ignore his question at all. It was in the queue and there were questions before him. But either way, his initial question is a really good one, and it is, I know it's a tax, so obviously you're not a fan, but I'm really disappointed that the liberty movement hasn't embraced the fair tax. It rids us of tax returns, the IRS, embedded taxes, corporate taxes, all payroll deductions, you keep your entire paycheck, and would be the single greatest transfer of power from the government to the people in history. Taxation as theft slogans are getting us nowhere. The fair tax is already a bill, H.R. 25. Let's get behind it. Well, first of all, I mean, taxation is theft, period. No other way to, to look at it. There is no such thing as a fair tax. I don't care what you call it. But he went on to say in the email that he sent me expressing his disappointment, it's not that I support taxation of any kind. I don't. The main reason I support the fair tax is because it can make taxation voluntary when done right. It only taxes new goods and services. An agorist like me, who barters for these necessities, would owe absolutely nothing to the federal government as a result. Roger, I don't file my tax returns or pay any income tax willingly to the government. I haven't for 20 years. If everyone in the liberty movement did this, the current system would collapse. I understand that you have a family to consider, but if you're truly a man of principle, you would find a way to avoid paying the income tax in any way possible. It seems your solution is to submit to the king, file your taxes, and pay him his due for fear of retribution, and for a man of principle, that is disappointing. I have lost my family as a result of my stance on this issue, and my longtime girlfriend and mother of my young child refuses to marry me or even live with me out of fear that the IRS will lock me up and or raid our home for my unwillingness to cooperate with the tax system. I don't want to cancel my sponsorship of the show. It's amazing. But this is the only issue that keeps me up at night, and if you aren't willing to address it in a meaningful way on the show, I see no reason to continue as a supporter. Okay, so that's a lot to break down. I've been called out as being unprincipled by someone I respect, and basically also threatened with him removing his support if I don't meaningfully answer his question. Wow. First, let's break down the reasons why I'm against the fair tax. It's simply this. I am against taxation as a coercive theft of my labor and resources. Now look, I know I've used this quote several times on this show, but it bears repeating here. William Lloyd Garrison said this way back in 1831 talking about slavery. And let's be honest, taxation is a form of slavery. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Are you 5% a slave because you pay 5% of taxes? Are you 25% a slave because you pay 25% of taxes? Or are you 100% of slave like they were in in the 1850s. Now look, as an aside, I'm sitting right next to a painting in my home of William Lloyd Garrison right now. Now Garrison said, I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no, Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hand of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. 
but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard. You know, much like Garrison, I will never retreat on this issue as long as I live. Garrison also said, Urge immediate abolition as earnestly as we may. It will, alas, be gradual abolition in the end. We have never said that slavery, replace that word with taxation, would be overthrown by a single blow. That it ought to, we shall always contend. Now, following Garrison's advice, I will never call for incremental change in theft or slavery. I will call for the abolition of theft, slavery, and coercion always. However, would I accept the fair tax over what we have today as an incremental step in the right direction, much as I cheer on medical cannabis or cannabis legalization? Of course I would, and for many of the reasons that you laid out in your comments. It is a much better tax than we have today, but it is still a tax. And I will never support a tax, whether it is a more benign tax than we currently have or not, and whether it benefits me personally or not. Now, to speak to the comments from your email, look, I applaud your principled stance for not filing tax returns, much like I respect other libertarians who put their lives and liberty on the line the same way, like Ian Freeman and Carl Wattner. You have clearly suffered greatly for your stance, and that is to be lauded. You are truly striking the root, and man, I fucking love you for it. Now, while I personally do avoid as many taxes as I possibly can without sticking my neck out, you're correct. I do not go as far as I likely should and stop filing my returns altogether like you do. I would love to hear how you've been able to accomplish this and stay out of prison. For example, until last summer, I was employed by companies that always took my taxes out of my paycheck unwillingly and reported all of that to the IRS. To get my money back, I had to file taxes. Now, granted, for the last year, I've worked as a contractor and no taxes are taken out of my check directly. However, that income is reported to the IRS. If I stop filing completely, that is a huge red flag and puts me at risk of garnishment, having my bank accounts taken from me, being kidnapped, and taken away from my family that relies on me for money. Are you going to support my family while I'm sitting in prison? I didn't think so. Look, I would just be another statistic, another cog in the justice system wheel, nothing more. And my children would not have me in their lives. And they would not have my income to feed them, clothe them, and shelter them. How would that outcome help make me, or anyone else, more free? It wouldn't. Look, I get you, man. I get what you're saying. But as long as my children rely on me, I am going to pay my taxes through the point of a gun. Certainly not voluntarily. Jess and I have talked for years about how our lives will change when our boys are on their own how we can take much bigger risks and make much bigger stands against the current course of government. Right now, I would only be hurting my family by doing so. Call me unprincipled if you like, and you may be right. But for at least the next eight years, that's just how it's going to be. Now, I don't want to lose your support, but I understand if you stop it. But I do appreciate your questions and your support regardless. Wow, so that answer went on much longer than I anticipated. I thought I'd have more time for more questions, but... At this point, I only have time for one more short question from Daryl W. Perry. Regarding my recast of the show questions from a few weeks ago, I got the idea from another podcast I listened to where they get asked these kinds of questions all the time, and they generally just recast one or two people into that thing. That said, who from Star Trek would you cast to play Luke Skywalker? Who from Star Wars would captain the Enterprise, and in what version of Star Trek? Thanks, Daryl. This is a bit more specific and easier to answer, so let me give this my best shot. I would have to give William Riker the Luke Skywalker role. Riker started off learning from his master, Picard, and then became pretty much a badass in his own right. And of course, Han Solo would captain the Enterprise in every single version of the show if I were writing it. Thanks for the question, Daryl. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite house guest host, Jessica, for her help with this show. For the show notes to this episode where I put links and other information that's been on the show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 132. I don't have any new supporters this week, but thanks to all of my awesome supporters, I'm at $267.57 per episode or 53.31% of the way towards my goal of $500 per episode. Thank you for all of your support, guys, really. 
Remember, when I hit this next goal, I'm going to be upping the content that I bring you from half an hour per week to a full hour. I know you want more content from me, and I want to give it to you. So add your pledge today to help me, to help me bring you twice the lava flow that you're getting today. So exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per-episode donation of as little as a buck an episode using Federal Reserve notes through Patreon or monthly using Subscribestar or using cryptocurrencies through Bitbacker. I want to be able to bring you more content soon, so make sure to add your donation today to help make that happen. I have two new Apple podcast reviews this week. Actually, these are a bit older, from two or three weeks ago, but for some reason my report never showed these until the last few days. Titan Uranus says, absolutely brilliant. If you haven't listened yet, what the actual blank. Great content, well-produced, informative, and not afraid to call it as it is. Music to this Aussie's ears. Five-star podcasting. Thanks so much, Titan, from across the pond. I think this might be my very first review from Aussie land. Awesome review, man. Thanks. Jazzy Knight said, let the lava flow into your ear holes. I love this show. Roger nails the issues that matter most. By incorporating principles of liberty into each new story, he really makes you look at the world in a much more candid but positive light. Do yourself a favor. Listen and learn how to embrace liberty to better yourself and those around you. His deep, sexy voice is also quite soothing. (laughs) 11 out of 10. Thanks, Roger. Jazzy, thank you so much for that kick-ass review. Deep, sexy voice? I love it, man. And if you guys have a minute and you want to hear your review read right here on the show, please go to the Lava Flow and leave me a rating and a review. All the cool kids are doing it, like Titan and Jazzy. Thank you so much to everybody who has left me a rating and a review so far. You guys rock. To all of you who haven't, can you guys help me out and go leave a review for me? Go to the lavaflow.com slash apple to do that now. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.